welcome to the American Compass podcast. My name is Oren Cass. I am Executive Director at American Compass, and I am delighted today to be joined by Mr. Patrick Ruffini. Patrick, how are you, sir? I'm doing very well. Great to be here. It's great to see you. Patrick is, I actually don't know your title. I just know you are Echelon Insights, along with Kristen, but a, a leading pollster of, of the of the American nation and, and certainly the, the Republican Party and importantly author of the recent Party of the People Inside the Multiracial Population, po- Multiracial Populist Coalition, Remaking the GOP. I read exclusively on Kindle, so I can't hold it up for everybody to see, but I can assure them that I have, I have positioned it on my screen to look. Um, I really want to talk about it. Also should say, really just enjoy your commentary generally. I think there are there are many people out there who I know, oh, if, if, if they're commenting on something we've been doing, it's just going to be complaining or it's just going to be complimentary. You are the rare person who I always have to say, oh, I wonder what Patrick actually said, because it, sometimes it is complimentary and, and sometimes not so much. Um, but I, I think you obviously have an, an incredibly sharp perspective on, on what is going on with American politics and, and with, the, uh, with the right of center in particular. Um, so I guess I, I wanted to start here. The, the book really focuses on the idea that the sort of the divide between college and non-college is now the, the main divide that sort of explains American politics. Um, I certainly, I, I agree with that. Um, I think what's a lot harder to understand is why, um, both why, why is it that college is what defines it and why has that become the thing that defines it when it it didn't used to be what what do you think explains this sort of development that we're experiencing sure i mean i think that there is uh, a very um let's say political sciencey answer to this question um that you know goes back all the way to the 1960s and 1970s really um to the post-war era where um, you really have had um, uh, largely since that time period a surge in the number of people as a share of the voting population that have attended college and have completed college. Um, Now, a lot of that um, is, um, you know, I I think there's a question about whether that's actually reached a peak, Um, but it took a while for that to work its way through the populations. If you go back to the early 1970s, right? It's not that there were that many more people today, you know, uh, young people attending college. There was mm-hmm. actually a pretty good amount of young people in the early 1970s attending college. It's just their parents had. And it took a while for that to work its way through the electorates. As a result, this divide between college and non-college becomes sort of um, a clear like dividing line in the population where it's, it's not quite 50-50, but it's 60, 40, right? It's, uh, you know, it, it becomes possible. And, um, you know, there's a democratic analyst named David Shore, who I'm sure many of your listeners will be familiar with, who has really talked pretty persuasively about this, that it becomes possible for a political party, the Democrats in this case, um, to really appeal to the cultural values of that college educated elite and actually be able to make that a major part of their coalition. Um, and as a result, I, I mean, I, I think they, to some extent, Democrats have become more path dependent, right, on that electorate uh, delivering for them. And um, but there was a very specific accelerant to this in the United States, which was Donald Trump, which, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, I, I think this this trend had been happening for some time. Um, if you go back to the, post, the 1960s counterculture, um, all the way to the birth of the red blue divide in 2000, right? There had been this trend slowly kind of working its way over decades. And then once again, it accelerates because you have a candidate who, uh, you know, I think really, really uh, both simultaneously appeals to the impulses of the working class, uh, non college educated voter, and simultaneously repels the college educated, uh, let's say, upper income voter and, and does both of those things simultaneously. And as a result, you've seen this massive acceleration of education polarization in the United States. And it's, I, I, it's interesting. It seems like you sort of, you, you frame that mostly as a, a cultural polarization at the end of the day. To your point about 
also describing it sort of as upper income, it's it's obviously also in some respects an an, an economic polarization. Um, to what extent, my sense is you think the cultural dimension of it is much more powerful. Is is that right? And and if so, why? Yeah, I mean, and I go back to, I mean, when I started initially by saying it's a political science point, because this has actually been happening, and I probably dropped the thread on that a little bit, because this has been happening across Western democracies. It's not, it's not just a fun, purely an American function. It's been happening in countries where you don't have a Donald Trump, necessarily. You don't have this at clear activation. Um, what you do have, though, in many of many countries, you have sort of more right wing populist parties that have risen on the back of backlash to immigration um, in, throughout Europe, for instance. Um, you have, uh, you know, just today the developments and, you know, will will the Netherlands have a far right prime minister and negotiations for a coalition government there? So you do have some of this happening worldwide, but you don't have it happening in the exact same form um, as Donald Trump. But nonetheless, this is why, I, you know, I would argue it's 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 durable. But um, one of the reasons that, um, you know, you go back to the work of a political scientist named Ronald Engelhardt um, back in the 19, you know, and he first propounded this theory of materialism and post-materialism that um, particularly in starting out in some survey work he did in the Nordic countries, um, that you have um, really the younger generation in those countries really motivated by a set of priorities and issues that were different than the older generations that, you know, they were talking about, let's say, post-materialist, more cultural concerns, free speech, environmentalism, um, you know, ensuring, you know, we have a society where ideas count more than money. Those were the kind of the battery questions that he asked. And you still have an older generation that lived through World War II. Um, that really was concerned about material benefits that, you know, and particularly having, um, you know, particularly like, you know, social insurance programs and, and things of that nature. And I think, you know, what, as people have repeated this work over time, right, those post-materialist issues and concerns have just become much more powerful over time. And this is ironically, right, ironically a function of societies getting wealthier, right, that where you've actually had the rise of a blue collar politics of the right, where that's been possible um, without them necessarily advocating for expanded social insurance, because, um, you know, you, you're able, you, you, the working class, which I think it is exclusively right now, primarily defined to me, at least in political terms, as a function of college. I mean, there's no other way to really explain the political shifts that have happened in the last, um, in the last decade or so, other than by looking at education. But I think that, um, you know, the reason why I think you've had a blue collar politics of the right has simultaneously not necessarily embraced an expanded welfare state has been because, you know, the working class isn't as focused, right, on that on that topic in particular, because they are materially, I think, actually better off than they might have been in the 1960s, 1970s. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that's been a trend throughout the West. But is the so I, I guess the question in my mind then is. Why does why do the cultural issues line up the way they do? Right, there's a very clear first order link between college educated and economic outcomes in in a modern Western economy. There is not, at least in my mind, as intuitive a link between college educated and sort of progressive social value. I mean, there's some extent to which you'd say, well. But the, if, if you're college educated, that means you went to college and were brainwashed by a bunch of crazy college professors. But that, that I think, has some limited explanatory power and, and didn't seem to do a great job in the past. So what, why do the cultural issues break down along the line of college education the way that they do? It's a really interesting question, right? I mean, I think it's a, a really interesting. You get a very interesting foundational question because they, they, they absolutely do. Right. Even though we don't necessarily know what the causal link is, we we absolutely know that a preference for more cosmo, let's say cosmopolitan social values, you know, is much more prevalent among the children of the elite um, in in the in, in the in society. Um, it, very early on, when these divides were first manifesting, um, you had um, you know an irony, let's say, of Sort of anti-war sentiment being more prev, you know, prevalent among the children of the elite 
and the working class being the ones who went and fought in Vietnam, who what you know got drafted, and were able to not were not able to escape the draft because they went to college, and that's where you saw at least some of those types of social divides manifesting. But shouldn't that divide have cut? Well, sorry, I, the, like the Vietnam one fascinates me, right? Yeah. Shouldn't the shouldn't the side that hadn't been able to get out of being drafted and right. went, ended up in Vietnam be the anti-war side? That did not work out to be the case. And you've got like, I mean, I have a chapter in my book that kind of goes into, uh, you know, kind of the roots of maybe this alignment, this sort of center of the alignment of the right and the working class, because, uh, you know, it really does, um, you know, it was really quite powerful in the late 1960s and particularly in the early 1970s when Richard Nixon really capitalized on it. And, um, you know, it was particularly, it was not at the time centered around anything cultural issues as we would know them today, but it was um, really a, a, pa a divide on, you know, basic patriotism. You had this event uh, known in the, uh, as the Hard Hat Riot in the early 1970s. In 1970, actually, a few days after the Kent State massacre, um, where you had hard hat workers going down and beating anti-war protesters in the streets of New York. And then you had a poll taken right after that um, that showed, after, you know, black Americans um, siding more with the, uh, you know, construction workers than they were siding with the protesters. So this is, I mean, I feel like it's been a durable link. Um, you've also had, you know, people talking about, you know, and this, this is, trend has been true throughout history that you had at the time a considerable segment of the population that were World War II veterans and just did mm -hmm. not like. Uh, you know, uh, really viscerally disliked uh, this sort of revolt, uh, what Pat Buchanan called the revolt of the overprivileged, right? Um, the, the, the college campus backlash um, to the war. And that was really kind of, I think, the starting to do the jumping off point for a lot of what we're seeing today. Yeah, the patriotism I, I point, I think, actually is a really interesting one that that clearly plays a role in in some piece of this it brings to mind for me the 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 somewheres versus anywheres dichotomy that to some extent there seems to underlying a lot of these sort of cultural divides be this more foundational commitment on on one side to the nation the idea of sort of pride and identity as americans a connection from there to sort of a whole host of more traditional cultural um, priorities as compared to, I think you were also sort of seizing on kind of cosmopolitanism as one of the key features of, of what you see as the very progressively, you know, the, the progressive, socially liberal, college-educated demographic. I guess what jumps out to me about that, and, and maybe, I'm, maybe I'm just a Marxist for looking for the material roots of everything, um, but doesn't that only make sense if there's fundamentally an, an economic explanation for it? That is that there's one group of people whose economic and, and sort of well-being in the world is much more connected to preserving this set of things versus a group that actually has their fate much more tied to ignoring or, or dissolving it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think well, one thing you can say is that the, let's say, the elite um, probably lives in uh, in a world in which they're much more accustomed to exposure to other societies or you know, even to traveling abroad or to dealing or having dealings with um, people abroad or to some extent um, having, uh, I, I mean, I think the question of immigration is a complicated one, particularly for high-skilled immigration, but, um, but the, the, the certainly, once again, the you know, idea is certainly pretty robust that um, you do you do you do have this college educated elite that has traveled abroad more broadly, just uh, is much more comfortable, um, and um, this is also tied to you know some people have tried to tie this to the psychological trait of openness to experience, right? That um, that, that also maps on to politics and education and all sorts of things. Um, and I, I think, you know, to some extent, I think the most compelling, the most convincing argument that I've heard um, in terms of, you know, there being, um, let's say, a, an, a, an economic populist revolt um, that manifested a political realignment was uh, the issue of trade and globalization and 
you know, areas of the country that were deindustrialized because of trade agreements and Trump really seizing on that as an issue where that wasn't a really um, a, 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 something that, you know, at least the mainstream Republican establishment was really seizing upon in their campaigns book. Um, so he acted maybe a group of people who who's very much uh, their, uh, you know, their um, identity their sense of economic security was tied to the local factory that has since shut down. Um, and I think to some extent, you know, I mean, that has really been a shift in say the leadership core of the Republican party, where it's not that that sentiment hasn't existed. Um, but you had somebody who was willing to tap into it in a way that no one else had before. Yeah. And. So I'm curious on when we use the term, you know, cultural issues, social issues, it's funny how that itself has changed over time. I mean, there was a time when it meant, I guess, guns and abortion and then gay marriage. And then it has sort of evolved to now this newer cluster of issues around critical race theory and transgenderism. And how how would you define it? What do you what do you see as the sort of core or high, you know, highest salience issues that are really shaping the divide and and activating people's um, polarization. Um, I would go back to this idea. I think there's a lot, uh, there's been a lot made, uh, obviously, of this shift from the, the, the old to the new social issues. And I do address that in the book quite a bit. But, but one thing I, I, would, I would ultimately go back to um, what we were discussing earlier, this idea of um, patriotism and, uh, you know, the idea of, um, you know, for a lot of people not to, you know, you know, for a lot of people, um, that sort of identity of, let's say, the Republicans as a party that has more strong, let's say, supported the military, right? Um, that, that doesn't really, not necessarily saying anything about what the global involvement of, of that should be, right. but that has historically been more identified with military veterans and strong national defense, Right. Uh, that that, um, you know, I think this turned out to be a pretty salient cu cultural dividing line, particularly, um, you know, I talk, obviously, uh, there's been a lot of focus about in this book about, you know, uh, what does it say about the multiracial changes in the country? But when you talk about a U.S. military that is, uh, you know, more non-white than the population as a whole, um, I think that becomes inherently like cleavage, right, with the modern left, which, you know, has been historically not associated with those things. Um, but I think, I think one of the shifts, right, the shift in the social issues is really important. And I think, you know, primarily it, um, Donald Trump himself really ushered in a shift. And um, I grew up near New York City. So I knew Trump as the sort of brash tabloid figure, or the real estate developer. And, you know, this was, you know, during the Giuliani era in New York City. And there was a very real culture war at the time, and the culture war was around issues like support for the police. Uh, you know, it was primarily revolving around um, the issue of crime um, and um, and other things. And you do, didn't really have much of a, a of a dividing line around, let's say, social and cultural issues, because you know uh, people who were on the right weren't really living in a very liberal mm -hmm. liberal place like. Um, but the battleground really was, um, you know, specifically around crime, policing, and those sorts of issues. And I think in some ways, um, Donald Trump took that model and make it, made it national. And it was ultimately a more broadly and extended it to include immigration, extended, extended it to include border security. And in a way that could appeal, you know, to people who were, let's say, cultural conservatives and who were both secular and religious. Whereas I think the previous definition, right, of these issues was very closely tied to a very rural religious core, mm -hmm. um, particularly around abortion and gay marriage. And I think, you know, Trump himself in tw the 2016 Trump, right, I think consciously downplayed those issues, right? But the price of that was he had to give the social conservatives a bone. He did the, you know, he appointed the Supreme Court justices off the list, which then paves the way for the return of abortion, for instance, as an issue that turns out to be a less than, you know, profitable issue um, for Republicans in the midterm elections, right? It, it turns out to be 
that um, Trump's refocusing of these cultural battles um, it, it, along issues where the right had an inherent advantage, uh, including an, and a growing advantage, particularly on an issue like immigration, um, away from issues where the right was kind of losing ground such as gay marriage and uh, such as abortion or or never really had much ground to begin with. Yeah, it's a good point that it's not it, it's not really the moral majority anymore that we're talking about necessarily. Um, I think you spend a lot of time in the book on kind of what politics is ultimately about, which is who who is going to be able to put together a majority? What you know, what does that coalition look like? And so the shift that that Trump initiates is, is such an interesting one because there are obviously some people it drives away, but others who it brings in. And yet, at least in and of itself, it doesn't seem to solve problem. I mean, it, it, it's not one that even gets to 50% in a, uh, in a presidential election or seems able to hold, um, hold a majority in Congress. What comes next then? What what are the if you were to sort of you know you're putting together the building blocks of what a what a post Trump conservatism looks like? What what are the key things you're you're adding to or or taking out of of the structure? Yeah, I mean it's a that is a, that is the ultimate question here, and, and because uh, you're right in that um, you know the majorities have proven elusive, right? The definitive victories have proven elusive, even even you know. When Republicans thought they were going to have a huge win in 2022, um, you know, it turns out that this sort of aura of chaos around Trump and um, the, uh, you know, his, you know, his grievances around the 2020 election, um, you know, create this across the board penalty, particularly for those candidates who are most closely identified with it, such that it prevents Republicans from firmly kind of getting a majority, establishing themselves as a firm majority and leads to chaos, right, in the House of Representatives, which we see on a daily basis. Um, so I think what's true is that, you know, Trump certainly realigned the electorate in a way that makes it more likely and possible for Republicans to actually maybe get to have more pathways, let's say, to 270 electors um, by bringing states like Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin into play when they really weren't in play. They were just out of reach in every single election before. And so, you know, he seems to have this, let's say, electoral college advantage, right, in um, in both of the in both of his election, where if you just shifted, you know, uh, the votes in a few states in 2020, that actually that turns out to be very that would turn out to be a very different result. Mm -hmm. Um, but it doesn't help really in Congress because, um, you know, the suburban districts count just as much as the urban districts. And, you know, there's talk about, you know, maybe the high turnout voters are no Democrats. So, uh, you know, particularly in special elections, sort of this reversal of this Obama era trend where Republican cleaned up in every special election, cleaned up in every off year election. Now they're not cleaning up anymore. I, I think to some extent, you know, this this will be a very interesting test. Because you do have uh, yeah, this 2024 election will be a test because, look, you obviously have the Nikki Haley hypothesis that's being that is, you know, certainly being borne out in polls that she does do better and she would regain a chunk of the suburban voters that you know is off limits to Donald Trump. And as a result would be um, probably, you know, cleaning Biden's clock definitively. That said, Trump isn't doing that bad himself in the poll. So it has been very hard to convince Republicans against uh, a pre an incumbent president who is seems just so weak politically that every time he steps out on stage, uh, uh, you know, his supporters are, you know, fearing for their political lives because they don't know like what club, I mean, even, you know, in his recent press conference, right, um, that, you know, all, all of these things. Um, and so, and so the idea is, in practice, um, we are in the end stuck with Trump as, you know, in the Republican primary because um, both his supporters, that that is really ultimately what <laughs> the party wants, right? It is ultimately like, um, you know, he does have this stronghold on the party. And look, he's not, I mean, from their vantage point, he's not doing very, very badly <laughs> against Joe Biden in the polls. So there's very little to, very little reason to change course. So what's the, what's the upshot? 
that, if we're kind of stuck in that, going in that direction, it I think it's relying on um, some of these polls that show a dramatic tightening uh, among, of margins among Hispanics, among African Americans, uh, is hoping that that kind of thing can materialize. Um, and, you know, that's something I spend a lot of time on in my book because I do think, like, you know, if ultimately the Republican Party is going to go down this path, uh, being a more populist party, um, they're kind of stuck with this coalition. They're kind of stuck with this kind of voter, and they're kind of stuck with trying to, uh, again, broaden the appeal of this working class politics that, um, you know, they they benefit. They've certainly benefited in some ways from over the last few cycles to also include uh, non-white communities um, that primarily don't have college degrees and don't really share uh, the proclivities of the cultural left. Uh, and, you know, that's really what I spend a lot of time thinking about and focusing on in the book. And so is that, I mean, in terms of what that looks like for, a, you know, a, a 2028 political candidate, let's say, it seems like that basically looks like Donald Trump without the things that are unite <laughs> that are unique to Donald Trump. I mean, one of the funny things about even Trump is that there's obviously Trump the persona. Um, there's Trump the sort of unique issues that folks really identify him with: trade, immigration, and so forth. Um, there's also the part of Trump whose two main legislative efforts were repealing Obamacare and a corporate tax cut. Um, so is there sort of a, a, a beyond Trump that, that, that goes further than, than he went in policy terms and is a lot more appealing to more people in political terms? Or is he, is it sort of, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what, what that, I guess is the question is, is what does come after Trump that? I think it's, I mean, the ideal situation, right, is if you just, it's not a quite necessarily a question of addition, it's a question of subtraction and subtracting maybe the crazy. Oh. And I think like, you know, you still have to worry about the median voter. You still have to worry about building, uh, you know, a coalition that gets to 51%. And so I, 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 I too write, right, I'm not um, entirely bullish because I do write that the, you know, previous election cycles and certainly what could be true in the future is that you know, we get as Republicans, we get stuck on this 48 percent. Like all we need to do is get to 48 percent because that's enough to, in theory, win a Senate majority, although in practice that never seems to materialize. Right. In theory, 2024 should be a big Republican year in terms of with all these red states up. And you currently see this in, in races like Montana, where, you know, you, you certainly have an Ohio where, you know, I think let's say the MAGA base of the party is calculating that, um, you know, we can go with someone who is as pure as the driven snow on, on our issues because uh, we don't have to really win swing voters in these red states to win, uh, to functionally win over these seats. But um, oftentimes that approach, you just end up, you just end up short so many, it, it has ended up short so many times because you know, the Democrats are absolutely competing for every vote in those states and they know their political lives are on the line. And so um, you get these sort of underperforming, underwhelming Republican candidates in these down ballot races who get all the give you all the downsides of Trump in terms of his issues and his, um, you know, the, the, the things that he, uh, you know, puts forward, but don't get you a lot of his personal charm or upside. Um, and so I think that's that's really kind of the trick, right? Because um, you know, because I think going forward, I think if you could magically subtract, out, you know, criminal proceedings and just some crazy statements, I think Republicans would be absolutely well positioned uh, across the, the board in 2024. Uh, but ultimately, you can't divorce those things out. Yeah, the, the candidate does sort of seem like the piece that a lot of people try to write out of the analysis because it's... It's so much cleaner if you don't have to to take account of it. One thing I, I thought was great in the book was, you know, talking about, I mean, Clinton is, Bill Clinton, the, the competent Clinton is such an, an interesting illustration. You know, I'm just fascinated by Democratic Leadership Council, the entire process sort of of, of how the Democrats recovered from from Reagan winning 49 states in, in 84. 
And there was like great thinking and interesting realignment. But at the end of the day, a big part of it was also this guy named Bill Clinton. Um, and that does seem like something missing on the Republican side right now. The, the folks who are trying to look beyond the 48 percent. Um, is that something you just you, you just sit and wait for and, and hope it appears? Or where, where, where do you think that comes from? I mean, it's interesting because to some to some extent, um, you know, as a, a raw political talent, I mean, I, I actually draw up some clear parallels between Trump and Clinton, right? In terms hmm. of the original Bill Clinton, in terms of you know, he has this very roguish persona, and nothing seems to stick to him in the same way that it would stick to a normal politician. And um, he also has a way of talking to particularly working class voters um, where they feel like they identify, this is somebody they can identify with. Um, leave it, leaving aside what the actual policies are, um, it does seem like, you know, they have this connection to regular people um, that I think other members of their party that ran either before or after them, um, you know, do not have and cannot recreate. And even Hillary Clinton as uh, you know, who had the front row seat to that campaign famously could not recreate. And so I, I really do see a big parallel. Um, but again, he came with many, he comes with many downsides, right? He, in terms of alienating about the same number of voters as he brings in to the process. So it's a, it's just a very interesting type of political specimen because I mean, you know, I, I think if you go back I analogize what happens, what's happening right now in the Republican primary in terms of Trump's, Trump's uttering dominance right now. I think if you had, you know, if you had ha ever had a situation where, okay, a Ronald Reagan had to come back or, or a Barack Obama managed to somehow lose reelection in 2012 and managed to then run, uh, you know, uh, try to make a comeback bid, um, you would have seen, you know, similar dominance. Right. From those candidates, because, um, it, you know, that is uh, they just have this unique connection to the base of their party and are beloved within their parties, um, even if the results outside their party are pretty, uh, you know, are pretty variable. Yeah, that's that's a point that I make a lot about this primary on the Republican side is that Trump is effectively, I mean, cumbent. I mean, this feels a lot more like a primary where the guy who's already president is sort of winning easily over some people who weren't really all that competitive. And it feels different because obviously he's not in office, but he's he remains the leader of the party in the way a sitting president does to a significant extent. And and conversely, we don't have any past experience in the modern era of a one term president trying to run again. So the the fact that he, it, it feels more like a primary with an incumbent maybe shouldn't be as surprising as it apparently is to everybody who was, you know, sure this or that candidate was, was really going to give him a run for his money. No, I think that, I, that, that, that sense has evolved over time, but, I, but I think that's absolutely right. But I think I, you know, point I'm trying to make, he's not any ordinary incumbent, right? Because uh, a lot of, uh, you know, to some extent, George W. George w. Bush was popular at one point, but had significant problems with his base at the end. Uh, of his administration. And you've had, I think, this period, right, where um, Republicans have not been uh, in love, really, with their candidates. You know, you have the old Bill Clinton saying, which is Democrats fall in love and Republicans fall in line. And we've seen that completely flip. I think Republicans just at some point grew tired of falling in, in line. <laughs> and uh, this is what, we, what we've gotten as a result of that. Yeah. Well, so what about the Democratic side? Because I feel like a lot of times analyses of the realignment um, sort of take for granted that the Democrats are going to be out there screwing up on these, so you know, on, on these social issues and bleeding support, and and sort of the the side with the agency in this process is is the Republicans and whether they can get their act together and and take advantage of it. To some extent, that seems like insofar as that does seem to be what's happening. And, and the progressive left has, you know, we only continues to drift further out into out into space. That that holds at the moment. It, it, there's also a world where you have another Bill Clinton on the left, where where someone shows up in the Democratic Party and says, "Hey guys, this is actually still ours for the taking. If we could just 
remember what we need to do to be successful. Does that feel more or less likely in your mind and, and why? You're right that it seems like Republicans have not, if I was to screw up this golden opportunity, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's the, um, that's the thing. And it, because to some extent they have, in some ways willfully created this, also these drags on their own, you know, on their own ability to win elections. I mean, you know, I go back to January 6th, you go back to these issues and if you could somehow, you know, remove the fact that Trump is going to be on trial for these things, uh, then, um, you know, I think what he's actually doing in his campaign, I mean, I feel like I'm not hearing as he's been winning, it seems like both in the general election as well as in the primary, um, that it feels like there's been less unprompted mentions of, oh my gosh, the selection was stolen from me. But the problem is, I mean, both, the, both parties seem to have at least some kinds of suicidal instincts. I mean, it seems like at some times, um, and it's not just the the Democrats, um, but I think, you know, long term, right? I mean, I do think Democrats have a problem with, I think, being, I think their emphasis being out of step with some core groups that have voted for them consistently in the past, where I, I don't think it's so much that Democrats right now are going out and saying what so they're going out and saying defund the police, right? They're not saying those things. Um, but um, and yet, you know, you do seem to have an entire campaign that is built around this, you know, superstructure of Dobbs and democracy, um, which is a sort of fan service for the college educated elite in the party and forgetting in some sense that, uh, yeah, that you do have to appeal to uh, voters on an economic level, you do have to convince people that, uh, oh, you're actually doing a good job managing the economy and uh, making and improving things for working class people. And I, you know, I feel like that, 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 that focus and emphasis has been lost. Now, maybe they're banking on the fact that the economy gets better and, uh, we still have these advantages on all these other issues and we can, that ultimately carries the day. Um, but it just strikes me, we've had very little, I think, rhetoric. You know, when you go back to Obama 2012, really laser focused on issues like auto bailout, uh, disqualifying Mitt Romney as a titan of private equity who didn't care for the average worker. I mean, it's just a very different style of campaign than we just had just 12 years ago. Yeah, this was something I found really interesting in in a survey that we got back recently that that we'd done work on where you just look at the issues that the the sort of Biden White House and, and the currently ascendant left seem to want to be fighting on. And they seem to just be doing a terrible job choosing their issue. I mean, you can say, oh, well, you know, this, this is what they truly believe on, believe in and so forth. But at, at some point in, in politics, you succeed by picking fights where the majority of the country is with you, to your point about what an Obama tried to do, you know, certainly what a Bill Clinton always tried to do. And then you look at, at, what Biden seems to to want to be really sticking his neck out on, and it is immigration, it is climate, it is well, student loans is is the quintessential college versus non college issue. Um, do you think it is it it is it really just a matter of well, that's just what bubble elites think, and they don't know any better? It's 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 a level of incompetence from the consultant class that I have trouble sort of wrapping my mind around at the end of the day. I feel like the, oh, the only thing it really can be from a rational at political actor standpoint is I think they feel like they have problems consolidating their base, right? I mean, if you, this is the, these are the actions of somebody who feels like, uh, oh, we have, uh, you know, fundamental problems within our base and we have to really tend to those before we can go out and go and win over, uh, you know, some people who may have defected uh, to the other side. Um, I think it's a miscalculation in the sense of, I don't think their basis is as a majority coalition that it once was, uh, you know, particularly because, uh, you know, the idea that the, just if you could just bring out the democratic base, that's a natural majority of the country is an idea that's very much fallen out of favor recently. And I think the data doesn't support that anymore. 
um, in, in just in terms of, you know, the decline of the emerging democratic majority as a hypothesis that people believe like, oh, if you just, you know, because so much that relied on these gigantic margins, right, among African Americans, uh, Hispanic voters, that really only Obama was able to create. Um, so this idea that, oh, the Democratic base can carry the day, uh, you know, I think they're still clinging to some extent to that as a notion. Um, whereas as you go back to the DLC, right, they understood that, you know, the, uh, just the Democratic base was not going to be enough and we need to actually change our message uh, to uh, appeal to folks in the middle. And I don't really see that kind of impetus. I don't really, frankly, even see that very much on the Republicans yeah. right now. But I do think their base is a little bit stronger heading into this election. All right. One more question for you. You're out there polling, focus grouping. What is some topic that you see popping up, hear about, people seem to be worked up about, problem people care about that? nobody that that nobody in the political class seems to be be giving proper attention to i mean i feel like there's like it's it's one of those everything and nothing answers because um you know to some extent um I, you know i like to just keep the focus on the main things and keep the main thing the main thing and the main thing right now really does seem to be the economy for a lot of people and it seems to be the economy also surprisingly for um, some of these college educated and suburban audiences, too, that um, particularly in these places like the Atlanta suburbs that have had a rapid rise in cost of living, um, where things that were in places that weren't expensive and are now very expensive, that people really do feel do seem to be feeling that um, that very acutely uh, in um, in uh, in, you know, in, you know, in, and it's really not necessarily like an issue. I mean, that it's not necessarily an issue, right, where. It's the issue surprises us, but I've been consistently surprised by who, right, mm -hmm. is expressing the most concern. It's not necessarily, I mean, you do, yes, you do, I think, have just a high level of discontent, particularly with working class and non-college audiences when it comes to the inflation issue, the economic issue. Um, but it's really off the charts of suburban women, too, which I think is, uh, you know, I think will surprise, you know, I think which goes against the conventional wisdom, I, I think. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Do they have, a, do, do they have a, a theory of the case? What, who, who, who are they blaming or, or what do right. they think has well, that's happened? That's interesting because I think that uh, that's where I think Republicans are falling short right now because I don't think they're necessarily blaming Biden or, or they, necessar they don't necessarily have, people don't necessarily have a good sense of here's the policy that caused this. They just know what's happening. They just know it kind of emerged to some extent. And they also feel Biden isn't doing anything to solve it, right? Which is enough, I think, for many people to disqualify him. Um, but this idea that, okay, we can go out there and just say, oh, Biden did the American Rescue Plan. Biden, you know, spent all this money. Uh, and people will connect the dots. I think it's to some extent mis misguided. All right. Uh, and I think I don't think that people are really thinking about it in that way, but they are thinking about it in the sense of, well, he doesn't seem to be able to do very much about some of these issues. And it's really kind of a belief that, you know, maybe we were better off right under the last guy and without really a very clear understanding of, you know, maybe what all the policies were that went into. that. Yeah, interesting. All right. Well, that is Patrick Rafini. Patrick, thank you so much for, for making the time to talk. Um, the book is Party of the People. The firm is Echelon Insights. Uh, we will be back again sometime soon with more on the American Compass podcast. Thanks so much, Warren.